So this video is just to help you come to terms with our studio and this is what we'll be doing in the prac in week one. Learning to code is somewhat like learning a language, but not exactly the same. As part of your first workshop, we're going to have a look at the R Studio environment. So let's start that up now. You will do it something like this. It'll look a bit different on the Compute Lab workstations, but it'll look something like that. All right. So what we've got here, and I'm just going to get rid of that, is the basic way that R Studio will open up. And um, you can see that it's organized into some different sub windows or panes in the main window. And uh, I'll just go through some of those right now. Uh, this is what we call the console. So the console is where R basically runs and it's where we can type in uh, commands or pieces of code or script as R Studio tends to call it and um, run them and that sort of thing. And we can adjust the size of, of various panes. We can drag things and that sort of thing. We don't have anything in what's called the environment at the moment because we haven't loaded any data into R, but we will do that in a minute and you can see what happens and it actually gives us a little bit of information about that. And uh, we can change the size of the window also by minimizing or maximizing it. So if we maximize that window, uh, then the other one kind of disappears. And the other thing that we notice about the, the panes in, uh, so that's the restore button. We can do the same with the lower window if we want to. So there are different tabs at the top. So not only can we see what is in our data space, if you like, what's being held in memory. Uh, we can also see a history of commands. We can see connections. I didn't really use that, but also the packages that are available. So that in R is a, a program that relies on packages. So they're the kind of stuff which users of R have made and uh, they contain extra functions. And some of them are super, super helpful. We would use one for mapping. Uh, in fact, we use uh, packages most of the time. Some are preloaded. So things like graphics and stats and things as you'd expect is, um, are gonna be there already and we can do a lot with them. Uh, and some of the basic file handling things are there already, but a lot of them are not. So we'll, we'll have a look at that in other sessions. Similarly, on this pane here, we can maximize that and we'll contain uh, plots. Let's just move me over there. Um, we don't have one of those at the moment. There's a comprehensive help system, so that's pretty good. You can see the last thing that I looked at there uh, and so on. All right, so we're, we're going to go back to our files and have a look at some of this. Now, um, what we need to do is to work with data. So we can kind of generate data within R, we can type it in, uh, it's clunky, it's not all that useful to do. So what I would usually do is uh, having prepared a, a data set in Excel, and we'll have a whole session on this, so don't panic about that you don't know how to do it yet. I would then save that as a, a comma separated value or CSV file. It's just a, a simple text file version of a spreadsheet. I've got one right here called hubbard.csv and I'm going to actually show you how the R script works at the same time as reading in some data. So I'm going to I'm going to make an object called hubbard and I'm going to put into it and I'm going to use this symbol in R, the backwards arrow. It's just a, a less than hyphen symbol and there, there are shortcuts from doing this. Let's have a look at it. If I press alt hyphen, it comes up with spaces around it already. So that's kind of nifty. And I'm going to use the uh, function read.csv. And look what's happening here on the screen. Um, it's anticipating what I'm going to do. So I'm getting some autocomplete and I can actually choose from this list if I want. And I will, I'll choose just plain vanilla read.csv. And then if I hover over um, the command here, I get some kind of preview of what I should be putting in the box. But the only thing I want to put in there at the moment is just file equals and in quotes. And you'll see that R in, in all instances will 
close parentheses and close quotes automatically for you. There are some exceptions to that if we're not doing things quite right, but that's a general result. Okay, so file equals, and I'm going to put this one in here, hubbard.csv. Let me try to point with my finger then. Not so useful. Anyway, oops, helps if we spell things right, hubbard.csv. And so what that's going to do is create this data object, hubbard, um, by using the function read.csv, which has got a whole lot of default settings in it, which you can see there. And I'm just going to hit enter within the console, and that should run that. And what you'll see is that within the console, um, it doesn't do anything. We get no information, but if we now check our environment, we have this Hubbard data set. Okay, now what I would always do next is to see that it's read in properly, and so I want you guys to have a go at this too. Um, uh, there's a simple way we can do it. We'll notice that in the environment window, we've got this little spreadsheet type symbol there, uh, and if we click on that, we'll actually run an R function. It'll open a pane with Hubbard in. This is where open files live in this top left uh, part of the R Studio environment. And we can see we've got a data file which has got a whole lot of rows. In fact, it's got 260 rows and it's got a bunch of columns for different measurements on soil. So this is a a data set from actually a very famous field site, which it's worth having a look at. So let's just pause from thinking about our studio at the moment and have a look. Right? So here's Google Earth. Here's where we are roughly at the moment. In fact, uh, you guys are somewhere different from this. Um, but uh, there's my office there, just so you know, in the Soil Science Building, second floor. Uh, just go around the corner and it's on the left there. I get a nice view of Thurling Green, sea breeze in the window in the afternoon, all that. And I'm going to fly over to the Hubbard Brook area in the northeastern United States. Let's have a go. Here we go, flying around the world, crossing the United States, Great Lakes. And there we are. So there we have Hubbard Brook, okay? And that white line down the bottom is actually Hubbard Brook Road. So it's it's a forested catchment which has been monitored and measurements taken. You can see that the Hubbard Brook itself meandering its way through the catchment, relatively by steep. Google Earth for now, is there's a whole lot of uh, sites or plots, they call them across that, with particular locations on some uh, no UTM, so they're constant easting. What does that mean? Okay, north-south transects by the look of it, um, and spaced along there. So a whole lot of vertical lines basically across that transect without taking samples. Okay, just so you know. And that's typically what the type of data set that we will generate in, in VT3361 will look like something like this where we have a whole lot of locations probably not 260 with different measurements that you guys will do on samples these are soils we will probably sample water and sediments and some soils perhaps uh, but we will geographically locate them using latitude longitude or easting and northing in the utm coordinate system and uh, we will then make measurements Okay, so that that's the data. How else can we check the data? We can have a look at that, but it's you know how do you know if anything's gone wrong? I will point out one thing: NA is the special code in R for a missing observation. So this is exchangeable arsenic. So here it was either you know something went wrong, the analysis didn't work, or it was below the detection limit of the method. So they can't report the result. So they're pretty low numbers anyway, but the NA means you know they got a negative number or something, which a negative concentration of something doesn't really make sense. And you'll find that uh, they will occur from place to place throughout the data set and uh, knows how to handle those missing data. So it can calculate means and more sophisticated statistics by ignoring them essentially. Okay, so 
but it's a bit difficult to know whether the data have completely read in correctly here, whether we've got the number of rows we should have and all that sort of thing. It tells us that we have 260 observations. That's kind of useful. And also says that uh, we've got um, so many columns in the data. Uh, so, but there are a couple of other things that I'd just like to show you that you can do. First of all, um, and I'll talk about some of the things that we get from this. I'm going to use the STR, meaning structure, the structure of a data set. And we type in Hubbard as well. Okay, get rid of um, my email notifications. Doesn't really matter. Okay, and I'm just going to scroll up. And the output by default is spit out into this console, which is not all that convenient, uh, but it's okay. So structure Hubbard, it tells us that it's a, something called a data frame, which is what the read CSV function did by default. Um, and a data frame is what we usually work with uh, in R. There's something else called the tidyverse, which we may come to at some stage, but we don't, it's not compulsory in this unit. So it's telling everything preceded by a dollar sign here is the columns in the data set. Okay, so within data, the data frame Hubbard plot always takes an integer value and it shows us the first few. There's this factor called relative to Brook, which has two levels, north or south. So this tells us whether a particular sample is either north of Hubbard Brook, remember that wiggling through the Google Earth map, uh, or south, okay? So um, there is also a number of transects. Remember, we've got uh, north-south transects with constant easting, uh, and these are the transects here. So, and these are factors, they're categorical variables. And if we think, remember what the data set looked like, the, each row in the data set was a sample, and each sample is has just one level of one of those two factors. So we have the categorical information within that row of information as well within the data set. Okay, the other rows are different. They're either uh, integer or uh, what we call a, a floating point number, um, meaning just a, a number with decimal places. Uh, so easting and northing are integers, they're large, but they're still integers, that is whole numbers. Um, integers can be negative, of course, um, not northings and eastings. And then we've got a whole lot of measurements, and they're usually uh, continuous variables, so they, like pH, for example, could take any value between, say, 2 and, and 12 in the natural system um, at the extremes. Moisture percent, you know, might be anywhere from 0, you know, up to maybe 60 or 70 percent for a highly organic soil. It depends on a whole bunch of things, including how much rain has gone before. Organic matter percent, well, they're a lot higher than Western Australian soils for a start, um, but, the, you know, again, there's going to be a range of possible values. So we call that a numeric variable as opposed to a factor, which is a categorical piece of information. So, again, each row can take one of those and so on. So that tells us, and I would quickly scan through and check that to see if we've got any things in the wrong place. For example, if we um, specify a categorical variable with a number, you know, like a zero or one or something, it's probably going to call it an integer rather than a factor. So we may have to tidy that up. Now, it's easy to do in R, but we need to keep an eye out for it. Okay, so that's, that's one thing we can do. Uh, we can also uh, use the summary function. And again, I'll type it out, the whole thing, summary, and this gives basically a little summary table for everything. So right at the bottom here, we were looking at the proportions of different grain size fractions in the soils. It's a numerical table with minimum, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, and maximum. Um, and in some cases, numeric variables will also tell us how many missing values we have, how many NAs. And there's one there, but exchangeable vanadium, what, why you want to measure that, I don't know. Um, has 168 missing values out of 260. So the, the data set's not very complete for that particular measurement. And for other types of information, if I get to the right place, for example, our factors, um, remember this one relative to Brook, we can have a sample which is either north 
or south. Um, it shows us how many in each category, right? And it enables us to see that the categories have read into the data set correctly. So there's a few things to do we, that, that we can do to check the integrity of our data. Now, this is a pain, right? You're gonna remember these functions and then type in the code every time. What do we do about that? Well, here's what we do. We save our code in a file called an R script file. We may decide to use an R notebook, which is a bit niftier, maybe slightly trickier to use, but uh, well worth the effort, I think, and we'll have a look at that uh, in a bit, but not right now. So let's open a new R script file. I'll just change the size of the windows. Okay, so we can type our functions in here. So let's try something a bit different. We'll do summary. And you can see that in the script file, it does has the same kind of functionality here. It's automatically closing the brackets for us. We should get um, some hints on how to use the function. Uh, but just by hovering over it with our cursor, and I'm going to show you a couple of things which are useful to know about an R. So we can, we can just type that as it is, and we get the same output as we did before. Let's have a go. We hit enter. Oh, just gave us an extra line of code. Didn't run anything. How do we run? Well, we've got a run button, so we can put our cursor somewhere in that line or select the whole line or several lines of code and run them all together. I'm just going to put it in the line. We can click run and that will run the code or there's a keyboard shortcut for those of you who want to use your fingers, just control enter. We'll do the same thing. Okay. Um, so this is, I guess, a hint at one of the things about R. There are different ways to do the same thing. None of them are right. Or wrong necessarily. Some of them may be more elegantly programmed than others, um, but you, you do it the way that makes sense for you. If it's correct, it's okay. It, you know, this, we're not going to be too fussy about variations in code so long as it works and gets the right answer. Okay, okay so summary Hubbard, but the other thing, advantage apart from being able to save this somewhere, and let's do that now, we will save our current document. Uh, we will give it a name. I'm going to call it uh, R intro one. I'm going to give it the suffix dot R so that R knows it's a code file and click save. Okay, it appeared in our list of files. That's good. So save properly. Um, and we can edit that as well. So we, if we don't want the whole summary, we can do other stuff as well. Let's try something. I'm going to use the square brackets, and I'm just going to type in some numbers into them. And I'm going to put a pair of numbers in them, because within those square brackets, we're going to specify the rows that we're interested in in the data and the columns. Okay, so that says, give me a summary of the first 10 rows of the Hubbard data set and just show me the first five columns, right? So just to be really obvious, click run, and there it is. Let's have a look at what we got, okay? So that's all it did, it gave us the first five columns, it didn't give us everything that we saw before. Um, and obviously it hasn't used all the rows in the data set because the only values that our easting has taken are 280,000. Um, the only, uh, Category within the transect factor is that has been used as that one, 280,000 east, and there are 10 samples north and none south. Okay, so we know that it's worked, and there are a bunch of variations on that. Okay, let's try a few different things to do. Okay, we might just keep that at one to three for now, just because of the size of our screen. Actually, let's make it four. Get rid of a bit of space here um, and go one to five. Okay, just so you can see how it works. Control enter runs it. And so we get four columns summarized on the basis of the first five rows of first five samples in the data set. Okay, there are different variations on this again. 
go. So we can copy and paste lines of code as well. And I'm going to do something different. I'm going to put a vector of names in there because we can actually use the column names as you'd expect. Um, and I'm going to put, and the vector has this format, C, not quite sure why C, but C means a vector. And in double quotes, I'm going to put plot, All right? That makes sense, right? So summary of the Hubbard data set, but only the column called plot. Click run, away it goes. So we've got everything in there, but we only got one column. Okay, we could edit that and we could say, let's have a look at pH as well. Okay, what say, we're gonna run that. That's what we get. What say we can't remember what the columns are called? Well, names. Hubbard probably would help, right? Let's try running it. And there they all are. There's our column names. Okay, so we could adjust this a little bit further. Put something odd in. Okay, we'll put in um, exchangeable. Now, be careful here. It's case sensitive. Exchangeable uh, nickel, for instance. Okay. Control enter to run, and there they are. Okay, there was some values in exchangeable nickel, and in fact, surprisingly, only three missing values. Um, but there we go. So you can see how do you, you can kind of generate um, summary statistics quite easily uh, with some simple uh, functions within R, and we can save those. So, how are you going to remember all this? Okay, well. R uh, has this other thing that we can do is comments. Anything preceded with the hash is a comment. So summarize Hubbard data um, rows one to five, columns one to four. All right. So if, if we run that, it won't run that line, but it will output it. Okay, so we'll actually run the line of code below it. Whether that's a good thing or not is kind of moot. All right, and similarly, if we want to remember what this, uh, each thing does, so this is output all column names in Hubbard Brook soil data. Okay, you can put as much in there and that made, these can be really useful. They're useful for other users if you're swapping code around, but they're also useful to, as memory joggers for yourself. All right, so that's pretty useful. All right, uh, and what else we've got here? Okay, I'm gonna actually copy that. Okay. Um, and that's all rows not just rows one to five. Um, so this is plot, pH, and exchangeable nickel. All right, so we run that. And if we can combine these kinds of ideas too, so we could, uh, let's just keep an eye on this, okay, pH, the mean pH 4.322. Remember that, I'm sure you will. If you can't remember it, copy it just to get it at the end of a comment so it's not going to get in the way. And we're going to just do rows 1 to 100, but the same columns and run that. All right? Make sense? So we've got a different mean pH. All right? Delete that. Otherwise, it's going to get totally confusing. You're kind of getting the idea, right? Okay, so uh, look, we will pause it there for now um, after saving the file. And another thing that I want to do before we pause is just to indicate that we can save our environment as well. So if we've read in some data, we don't want to have to really do that again, remember how to do it. Um, one of the, the things that's uh, quite 
useful also while I remember it is that somewhere we've got uh, how we actually read in the data. It's not a bad idea to save that either. Let's stick that in the file. Okay. And Okay, so we can save that. But well, let's save our environment as well. And what I'm going to do is just call it, I'm not going to give it a name, but I'm going to give it a file extension or suffix. I'm going to call it .rdata. Now, the reason I do that is because when we run with an R project, um, which is another good thing to do, and I'll mention that just before I sign out of this part of the session, um, it will be the one that's read by default into the workspace when you open up, right? So that's kind of a handy thing. So you can see that it's it's actually run a function called save image and it's saved into my folder uh, where I have this R project called R intro. And if you can see the header up the top there, that's got R intro as well. All right. Yeah, that's probably enough for now. All right. And we'll revisit this. Um, maybe in the second half of this, maybe in another video, and we can give you some more stuff to do in the first practical, just to try and get you some initial practice and get you up to speed with um, our studio. Okay.